episode. Good night, everybody. God bless. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Please turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. I started the Bible study this week and I put in part three and then I realized, wait, this is part four. We've been doing this for an entire month, but that's okay. This is not a race. This is a slow, in-depth Bible study. And hopefully at the end of it all, we have gleaned and we learn, we grew and we changed. Amen. All right. So we're just reading four verses. Please turn with me to Daniel chapter nine. And I want to encourage you, please read it aloud with me in your hopes. I can't hear you, but your ears need to hear the truth, right? And also the, the spiritual atmosphere around your life and your home changes when the authority and the word of God is read because the word of God has authority. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah, prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall and even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate wall what an interesting set of words. All right. So let's pray and see what the Lord has to say to us. Good, good night. God bless. Happy Wednesday. Father, we just come before your presence one more time through the blood of your only son, Jesus. And I say thank you. Thank you tonight that we could join with the saints of God and we could do such a precious thing as learn to discipline ourselves to study the word. Indeed, this is a, a challenge for many of us. Indeed, it is a a commitment to spend at least one hour in your word, studying your word. Indeed, we know, Father, this is your word. This is, these are not my words, they're your words that you gave to your faithful servants many years ago. And it was applicable to them now as it is applicable to us now. So as we come before your presence one more time with grateful and thankful hearts, Father, we ask that you would forgive us and wash us clean in the blood of your son, Jesus. If we did anything today, to offend you, to hurt your heart. Wash us clean in the blood of your only son, Jesus. Father, the works that your son died to win for us, that it would be active in our lives. I lift your people before you, indeed. You see and you know the kind of week that they're having. You see those who are enjoying the vacation with their kids. You see those who are not enjoying it. You see those who are enjoying life and those who are not. You see those who are succeeding at living the daily life that we've been called to live and those who are just floundering and just completely inundated with negative thoughts and emotions and not able to thrive in this season. But I thank you that you, you are compassionate and you, you are touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You understand where we are. You want to take us places. So we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, for strength for your people tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that we've been walking through this week we thank you for the answered prayer we thank you lord for the, the new baby among us in our congregation we thank you for touching everybody but we thank you for the ways in which you work we thank you father even for those who are in a state of waiting for a miracle to manifest for the faith to endure and the faith to believe for those who are in pain tonight physical pain what pain it may be in their bodies i prefer healing i prefer the grace to endure the pain no one likes being sick father i prefer the grace the words is the, the, the peace that you give it passes all understanding and it's not a peace that man can give us a peace that you give your people peace tonight in the midst of the storm in the midst of the challenge and the struggle that they would find you find a place of rest even if they can't find rest or a refuge in anybody as you would says you are the refuge you're the very present help in the time of trouble i prefer for strength and encouragement i prefer deliverance tonight lord you know those who are in need of deliverance from mental 
issues, Lord God, from situations and from circumstances, Lord God. I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, for the power of the Holy Ghost to manifest in the lives of your people. Your word says, Father, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. And we know that sometimes faith requires stepping out. We also know that, Father, your word says, if you came, you said that. We didn't make the promise. You made it. If you promised it, Indeed, you're the God who can cause it to manifest, cause your promises to manifest in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. At the power of the Holy Ghost, your word said you came to set the captive free. Your word also says he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And Lord, we know that through the blood of Jesus, many victories were won at Calvary for us. So we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would indeed know what is going on know and be able to understand lord we'll be able to fight the good fight of faith we would understand in the spirit realm what we must do to war lord god for victories in our marriage in our home in our finances in our job in our situations in our circumstances everything in our bodies lord father i pray in the name of your son jesus for the power of the holy ghost to manifest lord give us the ability to discern how to tap in lord god to know how to learn how to worship you worship you in spirit and in truth to get first things first to set our lives indeed to position ourselves in the right place for the miracle to manifest in our lives i pray lord god for those who are walking in dark places i pray in the name of your son jesus that you would give them the grace to endure lord i thank you for those who feel alone and lonely lord those are just feelings i pray that you would fill them and fill even now their homes with your presence cause them to know that you love them with an everlasting non-dying love unconditional love it's theirs i pray that it, they begin to feel that love tonight feel your presence feel your joy the things that man can give you would pour out upon them even now that father even when you give us these things we will not allow people to steal our joy we will not let you allow situations or circumstances to cause us to become bitter and be angry and lord god sour our spirit man we pray, Lord, for the peace. We pray for the joy. We pray for the grace, the faith. Faith comes by hearing, cause us to, to pay the attention and heed to your word tonight. Lord, I pray for marriages, strengthen marriages, strengthen families. Lord, I ban rebuke every attack of the enemy upon our lives in the name of Jesus. All the plans of the enemy to thwart our future, to distort what you have in store, what you have in plan for your people in the name of Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so let's go uh, straight into the world. Let's do a little, um, what do you call it? A little um, intro. This is the fourth week, apparently, that we've been doing the book of Daniel. And I will tell you, the more I research, the more I realize I have to stop at some point in time. I said to Dave, Brother Dave, I said, hmm, I don't know what else to do. It's so much information out there. There are books upon books. Upon books about this, that the 70, um, Daniel, 70 weeks. I cannot share all of it with you, but what I will do, I am trying with the help of God to help us and all of us understand something very, very um, simple that we can glean from the word as well as be faithful to the, the true meaning of the text. All right. So we, we, when going through the book of Daniel, let's set a stage. Uh, the book of Daniel is written in two languages. Apparently, one is in the language of the his fellow men, and one, of course, was in the language of the the dynasty that they were under. Daniel, of course, is what an exile. He is was kidnapped, taken out of his homeland. He was uh, part of the royal line, and now he is in a foreign land, working for a foreign king in a foreign everything foreign nothing nothing like home yet he remains faithful to whatever he was taught when he was a child and a young man we see god really speaking to him and helping him i don't know how, what what to say about daniel it's an amazing story the things god reveals to this one man and tonight we are in a the point where of course let's let's um remind ourselves that god there are two sets of people in god's eyes on the earth of course in one sense it's the jews and the gentiles I, who is a jew those of course who are descendants of the the patriarchs we are not jews we are gentiles very happy for us to know the jews and it's, it's while it was their detriment it was our um place to find this place what was one of the mysteries 
right? The Old Testament didn't know about the church. Indeed, the, the, the mystery was that the Gentiles, us, we have a chance to have relationship with Yeshua, have a relationship with God, and indeed have the opportunity to experience eternal life. We know that the, at the time of the, 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 what we're living in now is what is called the time of the Gentiles, right? It's our time. They call it our time, our season. Basically, it's the time where Don Jews are given the opportunity, great opportunity. But of course, we know there will come a time from our understanding that the church will no longer, we will be raptured. And God will continue what he had started. So let's see something here. This 490 years that we keep reading about and keep hearing about, it is a set time, not by us. It's a set time by God to deal with his people. And he, whatever God starts, he will finish. What's really intriguing for you and I to understand is this. This is 600 years before uh, Jesus was born sixth century we see that is a, a, a long time and daniel through daniel god reveals what's going to happen in the future some of the things have come to pass some haven't come to pass yet but it's interesting for us to know indeed we serve a god no other person humans don't know the future we could guess we could do some little statistical um calculations and do some probabilities but we don't know. You and I don't even know what's going to happen one second from now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows all things. And this is what um, helps us as children of God understand we serve a great and mighty and awesome God. There's nothing small about our God. There's nothing little. The, everything about us, our God is big and awesome and amazing. As we go one more time into Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. We're going to hopefully wrap it up tonight. I know it is still, to tell you the honest truth, is that honest truth? But I know people say that it's, it is, it's still a little, I am not 100% certain, no clear on a couple of things because the amount, brethren, thousands, I would say hundreds, thousands of articles I literally have, have been filtering through because it's just so much out there. And and they know there's so many different interpretations. I will tell you this much. I can't share all. So I'm going to share what I what I believe to be um, closest. The, the people I've looked at are very solid Christian teachers. And the, the commentaries I've looked at as well are. So I am going to try it. I do not have this. What I'm going to share with you in the next couple of months is not the only interpretation. There are many others. So what I encourage you to do is not only ac not accept everything I say, but indeed you go on your own journey of research and see and investigate and study and find answers to your questions. Amen. Let's go straight into the um, Bible study. Daniel chapter nine. Good. Let's go. So what is about to happen to the Jewish people? Let's remind ourselves the church. Of course, we are many Gentiles. When the rapture takes place, God will complete what he has started. What's important for us to understand is the Jewish people are important to God. He hasn't and will never forsake his people, his original people, as they say, the Jewish people. But he has, in a sense, they've been put on a, on a, play, a state of waiting until our time has been fulfilled, the time of the Gentiles. Okay, right. So let's read. Let's get, you know, I like to give you some stats and some um, information. Right. So there are two people who I kind of looked at in terms of trying to figure out this whole timeline. Eventually, I would give you a timeline. I'm going to give it to you in a moment. But like I said, there are many others. So there are two books. If you have the opportunity to read them, there. if you look at online, I'm sure you'll be able to find um, different copies of them. Right? It's by Sir Robert Anderson. The name of the book is The Coming Prince. And uh, it's by... Harold Honey in the chronological aspects of the life of Christ, right? So those are two notable works that I will be pulling from and drawing from in terms of what I'm going to share with you in the next couple of moments. Good. So they say, right, there are three parts to the calculation. Now, it's what, what is um, important for you and I to note is there are 70 weeks that the Jewish people, God said he would start and complete. 69 weeks have already gone. And we'll, we'll go through it in a couple of moments. Again, I shared it last week. We are in what is called the gap between the 69th and the 70th week. 
what we believe would be one trigger to the beginning of the seventh year week is, of course, the rapture of the church. Um, certain things have to be fulfilled. A temple has to be um, erected in Jerusalem. And they have to be able to do, do what they stopped doing from AD 70. So we know all of these things still have to be put in place. They're not yet into place. But to the cal for those of us who like dates and who like calculations, I'm going to give you some stuff. And you should write it down now, right? So the, there are three things we need to know. The end date of the fulfillment of the prophecy, the length of time between the start and the end, and a start date, right? So you realize what happened. This author, he started from the end the middle, right? So basically, the calculate the in this passage, we've been given an, uh, a start date. We've been given the duration of the race and we were given what is the end, right? Let's go. Right, so where are we? We are in what is called the 69th week. Of course, we know um, Jesus is, uh, die. he died. And we believe at that point in time, the gap began, which is now, if you look at my chart, you see the summary of end time events, the rapture, right? So the time gap, 2000 plus X years. So this is where we are now. We are in the church age. If you look at um, in the middle now, right after time gap, there's a, a if you go to um, row above, it says rapture. So the trigger to Daniel 70 at week beginning is of course, we believe the rapture of the church. And then, of course, God will continue. And in seven years, he will complete what he started dealing with his people, the Jewish people, right? If you notice that the topic that I started with, I said, what's going to happen to the Jewish people? If you think they went through hardship before, hard times are coming for them again, right? Good. Chat time. This is my favorite time. Okay, let's go now. So... The, remember what I said, there are three parts of the calculation. There's an end date, there's a, uh, the duration of it, and there's a start date. The end date, of course, we believe was when Jesus, uh, the week that Jesus was uh, crucified, right? Which would have been, of course, we know um, the year he was crucified, we, right? we believe to be AD 33. So let's start with our chart. There was a beginning date. And what was the beginning date? In verse 25, it says, No, therefore, understand from the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Right? So that is our start date. So many believe that the start date, so let's go. The start date is 444, 445 BC. Now, if you notice as well in the passage, it's it the 70 weeks was broken up into a couple um sets of seven, right? It says how much weeks there was uh 62 there was seven sets of seven and of course there was one so the first seven weeks we believe to be when the decree was sent out for jerusalem to be restored not exactly the temple it took 49 year, um, years right seven seven weeks seven sets of seven for the jerusalem to be restored that is what that is what many hold to be the first um set of seven weeks right at that point in time now until that 60, now we know that 69 weeks had to pass until the Messiah, the anointed one turned up 62 weeks or six, not actual weeks, but 62 set of seven years had to pass. We'll calculate those numbers in a couple of moments. But what I want you to look at the chart now, right? After Jesus was born, we know, of course, if you look at it, 80, 70, that's a big date. We all know the temple was destroyed that year. And that was the end of it until then, up till now, no temple has been rebuilt in Jerusalem. And that's critical to the end time prophecy. And we believe to the seven year tribulation, right? See, we know now in this passage, I'll tell you, this is one of the mentions where we begin to learn about the seven years. We talk about tribulation, the seven years, this is one year part where it is actually mentioned. So we know now, um, if you look at the chart, the church age from when Jesus goes and when the church age ends, right? We see now that one week, one set of um, seven years will begin. The set of seven years will conclude with the second coming of Christ. All right. So enjoy that chat for two, three minutes. We'll go through it again. I'm hoping to set some sta a stage for you. Let's go for it. Right. So 
seven sets of seven of course seven multiplied by seven is 49 this was right i just discussed this with you but i'm going to go through i'm going to go through really slow 62 somebody uh, do some addition for me 62 plus seven plus one gives you what number it should give you 70 right remember i mentioned it's not 70 actual weeks but it's 70 set sets of seven years and we went through some of those scriptures last week right so seven sets of seven is 49 this was the rebuilding of jerusalem allowed right 62 sets of seven 62 multiplied by seven should give you 434 years and the last set of seven years of course we know this is the seven years of tribulation so the 490 years is divided into three sections let's go through that one more time the first set of seven years which is set seven sets of seven is 49 years this is what we believe to be the uh, time period it took for Jerusalem, the temple and the, the, some, the, the, the city to be restored. 62 sets of seven, of course, is 434 years. This is now the period of time for the re, from the rebuilding of the walls to the coming of Christ. And the last set of seven years, which we believe is yet to come. So if you look at this, and I'll, you'll see it right there, when I say we are in a, a gap, between the 69th and 70th, you can see it. 62 plus 7 gives you 69, right? Of course, there's one more. 69 plus 1 gives you 70. But the seven years have not started yet. So right now, we are at the end of the 69th, waiting for that trigger event to take place for the last set of seven years to take place. And then God's will to completely transform planet Earth. This is God dealing with... Um, his people as well as completing all his works on planet earth and establishing his kingdom let's go right let's read the passage one more time i've given you a different translation hopefully to help you understand it a little better it says a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion right so we know god god will give them a time to do what they want to do, but we know at the end of it, all evil is coming to an end. Put to an end their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision and to anoint the most holy place. So we know, and we discussed last week, that some of these were accomplished with Jesus' uh, advent on earth and his, his birth, his death, his resurrection, but some of these have not come to pass in its fullness. Of, uh, it has not come to complete fruition as yet. Right, so a period of how many? 70 sets of seven decreed for whom? A people, Daniel's people, and the holy city, of course, we know always Jerusalem, to accomplish the seven things we discussed last week. Good, we're going to go now. Good, what is the time period? One more time, 70 sets of seven, 70 multiplied by seven equals 490 years. Get your calculators. If I am wrong, please, right, I make mistakes. So I'm depending on you to do your calculations to get your calculators out you young people and young at heart and make sure that I do did all my calculations correct. Good. So 70 prophetic weeks, right? Seven literal years multiplied by 70 prophetical week, prophetic weeks equals 490. With 24 gives the comprehensive picture of the entire prophecy. Going to verse 25, it presents the first 69 sets of seven, which is 483 years, right? Verse 26 gives the events between the 69th and the seventh week. And verse 29 concludes with a description of the 70th week, which is, of course, one set of seven, seven years. Nice. Verse 25 now, it says, now listen and understand seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler. So let's go, back. let's stop right here. The start date is from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. As we go into our Bible study, you will notice that there are several decrees that were given. And we have to figure out, and we had to, and not we alone, all of the Bible scholars before had to figure out really what was the start date. Tonight, I'm going to share with you one author's um his way of figuring out that start date was to work backwards because we of course 
can calculate the actual year that Jesus died and therefore he worked backwards and we'll, I'll discuss that with you in a minute. It's important for you to understand in this verse is this. For some reason, there's a breakup of the six, 70 years and also we get the starting date of the timeline, which of course is the time the commandment is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one comes. So we know 70 Seven sets of seven and two sets of seven, which of course is 483 biblical years. You'll learn that's a different thing in Gregorian years just now, right? But what I want you to see is this, 480 biblical years would have had to pass before somebody turned up on the scene. Who is that? The anointed one, Jesus. So we see, if you really, you really have to know what's going on. So we see here the, the 483 years have passed. What has happened now in this verse 483 years have gone and now Jesus is on the scene, the anointed one. He comes to Jerusalem, the streets are rebuilt, strong defenses despite perilous times, right? So let's go. The time it takes to rebuild Jerusalem. Good. That's okay, buddy, we can go. Right, good. So now scripture records four decrees to rebuild Jerusalem by the Persians. There's one in 538 BC by Cyrus. There's Dar Darius in 520 BC. There's Ataxerxes in 458 BC, and there's Ataxerxes Longimodus decree in 445 BC, and that is the date. More many, I won't say most, because like I said, there's a whole thing. But if you want to look at a starting date, that is the starting date. I would agree with 445 BC. Good. So this author says most. Who have researched this area know the starting point as 445 BC during the Hebrew month of Nisan. Let's read the scripture where, it's, where we believe it comes from. Right? So we remind ourselves 462 by 7, the time designated for waiting for the anointed one to come, the anointing one to appear, who we believe is who the anointing one is. We, of course, believe it's Jesus. After the 49 years were completed under the temple, and Jerusalem was rebuilt and restored to a particular state, 434 years would have had to pass. And what happened at the end, what we expected to happen, would have been the appearance of the anointed one. Good. Nehemiah chapter 2 says, let's read it together. Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Atasutsi's reign. So we see here, we are given timestamps and this is very, very good for us because of course, um, external of the Bible, we can go back into historical records and begin to, to look at when exactly this person reigned, how long they reigned and what proximity I would have been, right? He says, I was serving, Nehemiah, of course, speaking. I was serving the king, his wine. I had never before appeared sun in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. And I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven. So we see Nehemiah, Nehemiah, before he opens his mouth, he prays to God. He says, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me and your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried, the king and the queen sitting beside him. How long will you be gone? When you return? And after I told him how long I will be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the provinces. West of the Euphrates River instructed them to let me travel safely to the territories and please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls and for a house for myself. And the king granted his request because the gracious hand of God was on me. I want you to see and just we'll just take one minute to camp out here for a minute. Brethren, Nehemiah is a servant, right? Of course, we know... Um, for my understanding, one of the, but if you correct me if I'm wrong, one of the functions of a cupbearer is to drink it before the king drinks something. So in case it's poison, he dies first, right? So he is a servant of the king, that king, right? And the king sees him appear to be sad. He asked him what's wrong, which of course we know um, from my understanding again, is that if you were even sad, that could have been a reason why the king killed you, literally. And Nehemiah prays to God. God gives him favor. And he has a bold request, you know. 
he wants the king to send him back home and give him all the money to do all the work he has to do in his city. This and this is not the king's um, people. This is not people related to the king. Nothing. This has nothing to do with the king. A servant of his makes a bold request and it says here, the king granted this request because the gracious hand of God was on me. Brethren, I just want to encourage you. The favor of God is upon us. All right, so I want you to sometimes there's situations and circumstances that you face. Sometimes you just need to step out in faith and believe in God. I don't know what you, you're facing, but I know that if you pray and you believe and you trust in God, the favor of God is on you. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what people think about you. All that matters is if God's hand is upon you. And if God's hand is upon you, the favor of God can rest. Speak it. Live your life as as close as possible as you would think God your, your word requires us and just trust in God right good so verse 26 now so we see after this period of 62 sets of seven the anointed one will be killed who will be killed the anointed one who was killed we know Jesus and the piece I want us to look at here is this so after this period of six so now at this point in time after 483 years have passed we have to look at one, did Jesus appear on the scene 483 years later? And indeed, did what Daniel say happen would happen? Was Jesus killed? And the piece I want us to look at here is this interesting piece. It, the question I'm asking you, and I'll ask it twice for us to really think about it. It says, after this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed appearing to have accomplished nothing what after that anointed one died if according to the script that we're looking at what would he have accomplished nothing asking you a question one more time so when the anointed one dies what will it appear to the world that he had accomplished nothing good so what i want you to imagine in your mind or brother dave and this is interesting eh? all we see is a comma but it, it, interestingly enough at this point in time the 69th year ends and this gap, which of course we now believe is a church year. So what I want you to see here is at this, in this verse, there's an actual split of time. Until nothing um, accomplished, nothing comma, this is the end of the 69th year. And at that point in time, we are, this is where we are right now as a church. We are in the 69th, end of the 69th week waiting for the 70th week to begin which of course we believe one of the triggers would be the rapture of the church so now what i want you to imagine is the church is god the church has been raptured and this is what is going to happen on planet earth we are not here am i right here at this point in time the church is not here so it says and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple good we know as a matter of fact indeed um israel is a nation now after all those years of all over the place living in all sort of places not their homeland they have a homeland now so we know the city in one sense has been re restored but no temple is there right so of course we know thank you jesus the temple is not there so we know jesus not coming too too soon right so but it's interesting to note that bad times according to the scripture bad times are coming for them it says whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood. So we know during that time, of course, we know flood will play a big part in destruction and war. And its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. So we know, of course, this ruler is, this, is who is the ruler? The Antichrist, we believe. So now, while we don't see the exact words like Antichrist and those things, indeed, from all our studies, we believe that we know right now on planet Earth, the whole entire world is entirely fragmented, right? There is no one world ruler who dominates planet Earth, but one ruler will come forward who will indeed Ghana, the all of the strengths of the whole world, they will submit to him, and he indeed will start off fooling the Jewish people into thinking that he has their good interests at heart. And then, of course, in the middle of it, we'll realize just now he will change completely and reveal his true colors. Good. So there are three parts of the prophecy. There's a start date. Remember, I said that. So the start date 
is when the decree is, was given to rebuild Jerusalem. 69 weeks would have gone. And of course, we know the end date of the prophecy is when Messiah is cut off. It is very interesting to know, brethren, that at the end of 69 weeks, Jesus indeed, he appeared, that is the, the last week of um, Jesus's life. It appears that indeed that Jesus um, did appear. The anointed one did appear and what the word said that what happened did happen. He was killed and the world and everybody else indeed thought that nothing was accomplished. My question to you tonight is what was accomplished when Jesus died and why is it that he to the world he accomplished and nothing was accomplished through his death? It's really important for us to understand that Sunday I started a discussion about that. I, you know, of course, time is always limiting, but it's it really important for us to look at what happened when Jesus died. He was, his disciples were thoroughly disappointed. His followers were thoroughly disappointed because what they believed that he was the one who was going to set them free from the Roman domination, but he didn't come to do that. He came to do something else. Indeed, on the outside, they were dis distraught, but they didn't understand what Jesus came to do with something in the spiritual realm. So that is what is hidden to much of us and much of the world. What Jesus' death accomplished in the spirit realm, no man could have accomplished and it needed to be accomplished for the salvation of mankind. Good. So just letting us know, shoot one. I, can, I had tons of chats. I erased most of them because I said it would confuse us. But it's just for us to understand that when Jesus died, right, it would have been Nisan uh, 14. And it, it could have only happened at one time, AD 33. Good. Let's go on now. 69 weeks. Of course, we know 69 sets of seven weeks. Somebody do a calculation. 69, what did you multiply by seven? Just make sure my calculation is correct, please. Oh, this for 69 multiplied by seven. Do we get 483? Now, remember what I said earlier? It's 483 biblical years. I know I'm being repetitive, sorry, but I just want to make sure we understand 483 biblical years. The last three weeks, I think I've been sharing with you that there, the way they calculated um, months was uh, there were 30 days in each month, not how we, as we have it now, right? So 300, and of course, we know 30 days in a month, 12 months, it ends up with 360 days. Of course, 483 by 360 should equal to 173,888 days if, if you... 80 days. If you see something different, you do a calculation and this is wrong, somebody tell me, right? So you should calculate 69 by 7. What do you get? 483 by 360, 173, 88, 80 days. Good. Here's what we have to do now. To calculate, we have to convert biblical years to Gregorian years. Of course, we know because we have the Gregorian calendar, right? We know that Every month of the year, according to us, does, is not 30, right? So the way that this author did it, of course, we know there are 365 and a quarter days in a year. Of course, that's why we end up having a leap year. We know every four years there's a leap year. So let's do some divisions. 173,880 days divided by 365.24. Of course, we know that's um, the whole calculation for the Gregorian year. It translates to 476 Gregorian years. Let's go back at that again. From the slide before, we noted that in biblical uh, days, this is how much days we ended up with, 173,888 days. Of course, that has to be converted to Gregorian years. Their calendar is different. And to do that, we would divide 173,880 days by 365.24. 2198789. They had to be really, really exact, I, I assume. That would end up as to 476 years and 24.7 days. Right. Guess who turns up? <laughs> Brethren, listen, this is amazing, you know, Brother Dave. Guess who turns up 476 years plus 24.717 days? 
Jesus is crucified. All right? I remember what I did. I already discussed the start date. It is so amazing. This is how specific our God is. Understand? Right? So when we look at, remember, we just, we just read Nehemiah about the, the, the decree. We believe it to be 444 BC. When we did the calculation, 476 years plus 24.717 days. That's, of course, we know that um, the 69 sets of seven years have passed. Guess what happens at that point in time? Jesus is crucified. What did the scripture say? The anointed one would be what? Anybody remind me? He shall be cut off. So that is what is meant by cut off. He is killed, right? But not for himself, for the people of the prince. Not for, but not for himself, right? So you need to go through this at another time, but it's just for us to understand how awesome God is that he would give them the prophecy and indeed Jesus would turn up at that point in time, the exact calculation that was given in Daniel, hundreds of years before this is predicted and it happens. Good, verse 27 now. This is the last one. We, we hopefully will finish on time tonight. A ruler will make a treaty with the people, which people remember the people we're dealing with are the Jews, right? So he will make a treaty with the people for a period of what? One set of seven. What's one set of seven? Seven years. So we see now the beginning of the term, the seven years of tribulation. It turns up right, it's right there, brethren. The ruler will make a treaty. So we know it's a seven years treaty we'll make with them for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, what is half? Caleb or hope one of you, what is seven divided by two? 3.5. Right. So that is why when we look at some timelines in the book of Revelation, we hear a lot about this period, three and a half years. After half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. So what is believed will happen is the temple somehow, I don't really know if the future is um, a mystery to me, not a mystery to God. The temple will be reconstructed. The Jews will get what they want. What do they want? They want back their temple. They want to start worshiping. Of course, they don't, they don't acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. But what when the Antichrist indeed provides the opportunity. And listen, brethren, do not think for a moment that what the Antichrist will accomplish is something small. Half of, more than half of the world doesn't want that temple to ever be reconstructed, right? And you know now what's happening in Jerusalem. No, I don't even, like I said, I don't know how he will do it, but he will, he will accomplish something which no man right now has ever been able to accomplish. That means a, a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, All right? There's none now. It's a, he will put an end and he will now, his, his true colors will be revealed. He will climax all his terrible deeds. He will set up a sacrilegious object that will cause desecration and a fit until the fit decreed for his defiler is finally poured out on him. Of course, we see his judgment time is coming. Remember, evil has an expiration date. The evil person, the evil people can do what they want forever. They can be deluded into thinking so, but not at all. We know he has a time. He has got to set up a time for him to function and to do what he has to do. But God will put evil to an end. It says until the fair decree for his defiler. Of course, we know Satan's end has already been determined. And of course, he, Satan will, he will be definitely led by Satan. And indeed, he will suffer the same fate as Satan. Good. So we see a little chat here. I don't think I need to go through it again. I, uh, if you want me to go through it again, brethren, in person, I'll, dis I'll discuss it with you. But this is as much as I'm going to discuss tonight. And we're going to end now. Good. Personal application time. You tell me, in your opinion, what did Jesus' death accomplish? My answer to you would be, to many people, nothing. To us? everything and this is this is to me one of the greatest um problems on planet earth right now there are many people alive to them what jesus did at calvary meant nothing to to them that's the existence of jesus meant and means nothing right so this to me and even there are many people in church who know a little 
but the whole story and the whole victory and the whole um, story of what Jesus, Jesus' death accomplished, they don't know. And if you don't know, you can't get it to work for you. But again, if you know and you understand what Jesus' death accomplished, it will mean everything to you, right? So I'll go off script for a minute. Of course, you know, that's why I have slides because I am not, I like to be able when I'm speaking to speak very clearly and I am not always the, the fastest thinker. So I have my slides, but I'll just go off script for a minute and tell you this. I cannot explain to you what happens in my own, it's crashed. What happens in my own mind and life when I spend time with Jesus? Like I said, what Jesus accomplished, really a lot of it was in the spiritual realm. We'll go into that scripture in a minute, but I just want to encourage you to understand with me and, and I want to help you understand that what Jesus accomplished is amazing stuff. He accomplished record, big words, right? But indeed, the time that I spend with God in prayer and, and worship and reading the word, it's like nothing I've ever experienced. There's nothing, there's not, there's a refreshing, there's a, a joy. I, I don't know what happens. So while it is, I am doing something that seems like nothing to the world. You pray, you know, a friend of mine called me this week and she said, you know, she had an issue and she asked me to pray for her brother. And I said, you know, I will pray for him. And of course, we know we had a lot of issues in church and in, in, um, my sister Alana had her baby. Oh my goodness, new baby in the congregation, you know, but we, we prayed about all of these things. And, and, and in my mind, I'm saying, you know, you tell him you will pray. But we live in a world where people don't, you know, you tell them that, but how do they know that your prayer made a difference? How do you know that your prayer makes a difference? Let's read three more scriptures and we're ending tonight. Let's read one thing that Jesus does. I want you to understand, and this is what I want you to do. Please write this passage down. The truth needs to come from your mouth and you have to say it. Colossians 2.15, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. When Jesus died, he disarmed spiritual authorities, right? So we see a lot of what Jesus, you see in the world things, when Jesus died, nothing happened. But in the spirit realm, everything changed. Everything changed. Everything changed. The spirit realm when Jesus died. Understand that much. So while the world looks and thinks it's nothing, that's why I said, what? When, when Jesus died to the world, it means nothing. To us, it means everything. Because now we have something that the Old Testament saints didn't have. We have authority in the name of Jesus. Not because of what we did, but what Jesus did on the cross. Next slide. Let's go. John 1, 29. John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Brethren, you and I have the opportunity right now to be forgiven of sins to be forgiven of our sins, to be forget. There's no man who can do it, only Jesus. And because Jesus came, he accomplished that for us. I believe this is the last scripture. Reconciled, no, there's one more. Romans 5, 10 and 11. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, so much by having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So imagine through the death of Jesus, while the world looked on and thought, Nothing happened. As a matter of fact, we know there were many people who were glad and happy Jesus died. He had to die because he had to accomplish certain things. It says, through the death of his son, when Jesus died, we were now given the opportunity as followers of Christ to be reconciled to God. And this is not something to be taken lightly. Like I said, the world looks at it and thinks it's nothing. Prayer is nothing. Reading the Bible is no biggie. That's why, especially the youth, because the, the truths of these things don't, it may, it, I miss a Sunday morning is no big deal. I don't read my Bible today, no big deal. I don't pray. I, it's okay. It's your spirit realm, your own spirit life. And the, the spirit realm around you is affected by what you do or what you don't do. Right? So I'll just say it again. Your spirit man, your spiritual life, the spirit realm around you is affected by things you do and things you don't do. Good. Uh, knowing that you, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, knowing that you were not redeemed, with corruptible things like gold or silver 
from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Remember Sunday, I gave the story of redemption where a, a little boy had the bird and was slaughtering and killing the bird. And, and the father said, I will pay you. And that is exactly what Jesus paid a price so you and I could be set free. He paid a price so you and I could be set free. He bought, he won us back. He set literally the bonds and the chains of sin of our life. Right? So the four scriptures that I just shared, I want you to begin to, Sunday I did some for you, but I want you to begin to proclaim, I am redeemed through the blood of Jesus, reconciled to Jesus. All of these things Jesus accomplished. But like I say, what, the first part is knowledge and the second part is the declaration and the, the, the declaration of it. So your spirit man will get that truth. I think we'll end with this last slide. What happens in the spiritual realm when you pray? Miraculous things take place. Your spirit, like I say, I cannot explain to you their words. Something I, I don't know how to explain what happens to my spirit man when I spend time in God's presence. I never said giving God a shopping list. As a matter of fact, the least favorite part of me for prayer is asking God for things. I wish I could just sit at God's feet and worship. That is what I love. And sometimes I'll tell you, I, I make a confession. It's the Sheila, sometimes I don't even, not like I don't love God and I love, love to worship, but when I go to start to pray, the, the hardest piece to me is to stop praying. And sometimes I say, Lord, you know, I just never have enough time. I just won't go, you know, and I'll tell you this much. Even me, I have been a Christian for many years. If I don't spend the time in God's presence, I feel my spirit, my, I feel different and different in a bad way. Prayer changes things. What happens in the spirit realm when you pray, the spirit, you all realm around you changes. What happens in the spirit realm when you read the word, Pastor already shared those things with us a couple of weeks ago. Amazing things take place in the spirit realm when you do something as simple as reading the word. That's why I asked you to read it aloud. What takes place in the physical realm? Do you know? And this is, I don't know, but Dave, how can this happen? Prayer is a spiritual exchange between me and God. It's a relationship thing between me and God. But I feel physically better and stronger when I spend time in prayer with God. I don't know if that happens to you. And the word is like when my spirit man gets the strength, my, my physical man feels better. So I'll encourage you by reminding you because the world thinks that prayer means nothing and reading the Bible and the word means nothing. This is literally power. And your prayer life, if you really get on track with God, is power. It's dynamite power. When you pray, things happen in the spirit realm. When you declare the word, but if you, we can, we can um, come up this slide though. When you declare the word of God over your home and your life, things happen, right? So I don't want you to get discouraged and say, well, you know, and there are times I have been in that situation. You have a prayer, prayer. You need a desperate answer. And the answer didn't come. And you wonder if God hearing, God is hearing. He has a time, he has a season for everything. I want to encourage you. The spirit, I don't, while the world is deluded into thinking, nothing, we are, uh, are people who have no sort of power, no authority. When we look at what Jesus accomplished, it was something in the spirit realm. And a lot of what we do is an accomplishment in the spirit realm. So the world don't see, people don't see. Like I said, when I, when I told her, I would pray for her, I said, you know, she, how will she even know if I pray for her? Because she would feel encouraged knowing somebody's praying for her. But how does she know that my prayer helped that miracle manifest in the life of her brother? I can't answer that question, but I can answer the question that says, when you pray, when you spend time in the world, the power things that God has given us, the spirit realm will change around you. I can tell you as a fact, I felt so different not going into when. My, when I go into the house of God, there's something different about coming, just stepping into that church, stepping into the presence and the power and the anointing of God. I don't like I say, I know all of us are different stages of faith. Some of us have real faith to step out. Some of us are still growing in faith, but I want to encourage you to step out. I want to encourage you as well to not be looted in thinking that you prayer, it means nothing. I want us to begin to experience the realness of prayer and to understand that many things in the world, that's why I see sometimes we, there's so much blessings and yet 90 something percent of Christians live in a realm of defeat, a, a realm of constantly, but now of course we know and we remember that we get up every morning and we fight to have, we have to fight 
You have to fight, brethren. This is a war we in. But we know that in the spirit realm, if you pray, if you begin to declare the word, the spirit, like I said, when you pray, the spirit, your spirit man is impacted and affected positively when you pray that spirit man build up affects your physical man and i want to encourage you to spend more time in prayer you know and what jesus said you couldn't pray with me for one hour if you want a a, a minimum time you should spend in prayer every day it's i would advise one hour and as well i believe um someone said you should tie your day which means if there's 24 hours in a day you should spend 2.4 hours in the word and in prayer I, I i agree pastor said at least what she said birthday at least 12 minutes 12 minutes, but am I encouraging you at least? Well, like I say, you have to know how, how hard you're willing to work for what you want. A lot of time, a more time in prayer. I, I, I don't want to put times on you, but I want to say, encourage you more time in the word, more time in prayer, more power. Let's pray. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Lift his countenance upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Father, as I lift your people before you, you see and you know. Father, we come before your people desperate for you, desperate for your presence, desperate for more of you, desperate for revelation, for healing, for miracles. Lord, we need so many things in our lives. It's unbelievable how needy we are. But we thank you that we have you. Lord, you are not put off by how great our need is. While we live in a world and a place where people don't respond to our needs, you respond. We thank you for the word. We thank you, Father, for the power. We thank you that Jesus died. We thank you for the ability and the knowledge to understand that we can have more than we have now. That we can walk in a, a greater level of healing, of miracles, of, of power and authority than we have now. We understand that what Jesus did on that cross was for us so that we and our children and the generations to come would ex experience true victory so father we come before you in the name of your son jesus asking you to teach us how show us how in your word teach us how to walk in that realm walk in that realm where we're so close to you jesus that we feel literally afraid to sin we are so aware of your presence that, Lord, we walk light and we tread light every day. That, Father, we are indeed committed to living life the way you want us to live. That, Father, we would spend time. Lord, you would wake us up and you would shake us up. That we would not stay in a lethargic, blinded state, Father. We would not remain dormant. We would not remain cold, but you would shake us up. Indeed, that we would become a people who know our God who know the word, who know how to use the word, who know how to speak things into being through the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost manifest in our homes and our marriages. Lord, we know this will require a commitment, but Father, give us the grace, the ability, all that we need to do to get to the point where we position ourselves to receive all that you want to bless us with, all that you want to pour out in our lives. We pray, Father, for strength in the inner man. We pray, Father, as we do the things that you've called us to do, that you would rebuke the devourer. You would give us the ability to quench. You would indeed quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We know every morning attacks come, but you would quench all the fiery darts. Give us the strength, the physical strength to fight, the physical strength to get up early, to spend time in prayer. Lord, evening, you would say evening, noon, and, and morning, Lord, all the time that we can't spend, we would spend, and we would develop, we would teach the next generation. Father, that is my heart. That not, Lord, we alone, but our, the next generation, that when that rapture takes place, every single person in our household will be raptured. Until that day, Father, we will not give up. We will pray that the children, the next generation, the spouses, the grandmothers, those around us, every single person in our homes will be saved, filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, walking in purpose. And Father, your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we move on to Daniel chapter 10 next week. Uh, please stay with me. Face, uh, Zoom family birthday will end the Facebook. Love you all so very much. Thank you for joining me. See you next week. For those of us who are with me tonight.